The very first animals on Earth, how did they even evolve? To go from simple protests to these massive, complex assemblages of organs seems an almost unfathomable jump of astronomical proportions. Not only that, there are fundamental differences between major animal groups that seem difficult to bridge. Yet one simple principle, playing on repeat, appears to have kicked off the stages leading to ever more complex body plants, highly adapted to different modes of life in various environments. So what is this principle and what are the stages it played such a pivotal role in? Let's find out, shall we? A multicellular animal is more than a simple clump of cells. It is a highly organized system of tissues grouped into organs laid out at specific locations in and around the body, often grouped in distinct compartments or bodily divisions. This is called a body plan, derived roughly from the German Bauplan, which literally means construction plan. Although there is some leeway, there are clear patterns associated with increasing complexity. Bilaterians are the major group of animals that, ancestrally at least, share two bodily axes. An anterior-posterior axis going from front to end, and a dorsal-ventral axis going from the back side to the belly side. Laterally, each side of the body is like a mirror image to each other. This bilateral symmetry tends to lead to cephalization, or in other words, the formation of a head. It is the result of the clustering of sensory organs around or near the mouth in the front, strongly coupled with a coalescence of nervous tissue into a brain. The mouth is the entry point for a digestive tract going down the length of the body, eventually ending in an anus for getting rid of undigested particles and other matters. But here something very peculiar seems to have been going on. There is a great divide in the animal kingdom that revolves around a fundamental disagreement on what is up and what is down, and where things go in and where they go out again. These two factions are known as the protostomes and the deuterostomes respectively. The deuterostomes are represented by vertebrates like ourselves and certain invertebrate groups like echinoderms, acorn worms, sea squirts and others. The protostomes comprise all the rest, most notably the arthropods, annelids and the mollusks. There is no doubt that they are all derived from a common ancestor. Their body plans are governed by very similar regulatory factors produced by so-called Hux genes. The earliest developmental stages are almost identical, being a sphere of cells folding into itself to form an opening to the inside and what is destined to become the gut. This opening is called the blastopore. However, in protostomes the blastopore transforms into the mouth, while in deuterostomes it becomes the anus. If that isn't strange enough already, in protostomes the central nervous system runs along the ventral side, but in deuterostomes it runs along the back, like our spinal cord does. At first sight this may seem completely nonsensical. I mean, when bilateral symmetry was established, how and why could this logically be turned upside down again? And how could a mouth switch basic function to something completely opposite? The picture actually starts to become clear when we realize how major shifts in lifestyle occurred again and again and again. Sponges are the most primitive animals we know. They are basically giant colonies of a specific type of protist called coenoflagellates that have distinct flagella they used to swim around with. In the sessile adult sponges, these flagella are used to generate water currents to catch food particles, while their larvae can move freely through the water looking for a place to settle. Now what's interesting is how these different life stages originated in the first place. Cope's law describes the tendency for creatures to increase in size to avoid predation. A colony of coenoflagellates could continue to grow until a critical point is reached where the flagella are no longer effective enough to carry it around and it would sink to the bottom. So in order to survive that way, it becomes necessary to adapt to living on the substrate. One way to do this is to anchor the body to keep it stable and continue to filter the water. The larval and adult stages are quite different. 
One is pelagic, meaning free swimming, and the other benthic, that is, living on the sea floor. Larval stages may become more specialized as pelagic swimmers up to the point that they attained a distinct front-to-back polarity, so they could move directionally. In sponge larvae, the same signaling pathway as in more advanced animals is involved here. Danish zoologist, the late Klaus Nielsen, is world-renowned for his meticulous analyses and groundbreaking theories on how the diverse animal body plants came about. One pattern he discerned in the early evolution of animals is how a significantly different adult stage is added each time only for it to be lost again. This is a phenomenon called truncation. Then a different adult stage is added and the cycle repeats. This repetitive pattern accounts for the different phases that led to ever more complex animals. In one lineage, the sponge-like adult stage was presumably skipped so now that we have a free-swimming, directional adult form, these may specialize further with their cells attaining tighter junctions so as to form sheet-like epithelia together. For these, they repurposed specialized transmembrane proteins called cadherins. Epithelia consisting of such flagellate cells are called ciliated. Such an advanced ciliated larva is a very good ancestral model animal called a Blastea. The epithelia on one side of the creature then becomes more specialized in food capture and digestion and even folds inwards to form a primitive gut. A creature with this configuration is said to be a so-called gastrea. Basically, it's a free-swimming, ciliated stomach. In order to grow bigger again, following Cope's law, a new strategy would have to be employed to adapt to the substrate this time. Here, a polyblack form is an obvious solution with tentacles to lead food towards the mouth. This is basically the Cnidarian body plan, with a pelagic larva called a planula and the adult forms being sea anemones, jellyfish and the like. During the next phase, the flagellate external cells are organized into ciliary bands surrounding the blastopore. Ciliary bands need to coordinate with each other and the sensory organs in order to determine direction. They essentially become the foundation for the nervous system. Now this is where it starts to become really interesting. The early ancestor of bilaterians likely started out as another truncation of a cnidarian great animal. The result is a more highly organized pelagic animal and this phase is called the trochea. Now imagine Cope's law coming to force again. The ciliary epithelia may not be strong enough to propel too large a body through the water, but they can help move it over the substrate. During the Precambrian, the seafloor was covered with yummy microbial mats, so there was plenty to eat there too. The underside would be where all the cilia are concentrated, especially around the gut opening. This is basically how smaller flatworms still go about their lives today. Their bodies still have a single opening turned towards the bottom with which they ingest anything edible and also expel anything undigested again. Feeding is very important and facilitated by the ciliary bands. So these are typically grouped around the primordial mouth or blastopore. The slit-like blastopore then sip together in the middle leaving only the anterior and posterior ends open. The anterior opening then became the mouth and the posterior became the anus. At the same time, the ciliary bands came together as well to form the ventral nervous system as seen in protostomes with the typical circumoral ring that is still a major feature of this group. The reason for this is that the sensory organs are located in front of the mouth so the nervous system had to go around the eucivicus in order to reach those. So this seemingly simple cycle of the development of an adult form by increasing size, further specialization of the larval stage and then truncation of the adult stage is what appears to have driven the evolution towards modern animals. Now because a larval stage is often non-feeding, the placement of the mouth and with it the position of what was to become the central nervous system is still a bit flexible. So this is how in deuterostomes this could more easily have flipped during an early phase. 
and the continuation of the truncation cycle process appears to have driven the further evolution towards vertebrates. How that unfolded exactly, you can learn more about in my upcoming video on the vertebrate recipe. In the meantime, you can check out my earlier video on body plans over here. Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and maybe even a sub if you haven't already. Thanks for sticking around. Until next time, stay sharp and stay evolved.